Peter traveled south for almost an hour, feeling certain that Pax had traveled the same route. But when he emerged from the woods, he stopped. A vast meadow sloped down for at least a mile before flattening into another mile of wide green floor. At the base of that, the land rose hundreds of feet in jagged steps as if chopped with a giant hoe, and beyond that, rolling to the horizon, was the forested plateau that hid the gorge. Since walking, no, since waking, he traveled nine hours without thinking of rest once, but now the stunning immense immensity of the distance ahead drained what was left of his energy. He dropped his pack and fell to the ground. Nine hours of gripping the crutch handles and stiffened his hands had stiffened his hands to claws. He forced them open and felt and felt the raw palm split. They'd blistered the day before, broken open and blistered again. He poured cool water from his thermos over the hot pulp of his palms and set to work picking out shreds of tire rubber. Then he eased his extra pair of socks over his hands and looked out again. A moon halfway down the alley, I mean halfway down the valley, caught his eye. Something trotted in bouncing dips between two trees. Fox movement. Peter rose to his knees. Pax! There was again. But no, whatever was there was tan, not red. Coyote, maybe. The thought was a shot of adrenaline. And suddenly, he was moving in, pack slamming against his back, crutches positioning positioning down the hill all the way to the valley b bottom. In just half an hour, and then sinking into the bog air ground there, muddy and slower, but still moving. And then a ten-foot sheer rock wall loomed in front of him. The cliffs were a lot taller than they had appeared from across the valley. Before he could second guess himself, Peter hurtled his back, his pack, and his crutches up and heard th them clatter onto a stony ledge. He wedged his fingers into a crevice and pulled. His cast scraped along the rough rock face, but his arms were strong from volus training, and he levered himself onto a shallow foothold. From there, he reached for a juttering tree, a jutting tree, then another crack in the rock. And then he heaved himself over the first first ledge. It took an hour to climb. He stepped, rise that way, crutches and pack first, and drag himself after. When he reached the crest, panting and sweat soaked, he fell to the ground under tall pine. He drained his thermos in one swallow, and ate the last of the ham sandwiches. He opened Vola's second packet, peanut butter. Peter's throat closed. He remembered the first time Pax had found an empty jar in the trash and squeezed his snout in so deep it had gotten stuck, and Peter had laughed until it had hurt. He st he stuffed the sandwich back into the bag, wishing he'd found it the day before, and tossed it to the dog scavenging the dumpsters and got up again. It was almost six o'clock, and he had a ways to go still. As he traveled, the, mem the memories of, th of those hungry-eyed animals accompanied him, darting and retreating like accusing ghosts. He wished he could tell them that he knew how it felt to have the one person who had loved you and taken care of you suddenly vanish. How, how the world suddenly seemed dangerous after that. He had lost a parent. How many kids this week? he wondered, had woken up to find their worlds changed that way. Their parents gone off to war, maybe never coming home. That was the worst, of course. But what about the smaller losses? How many kids missed their older brothers or sisters for months at a time? How many friends had to say goodbye? How many kids went hungry? How many had had, had to move? How many pets had they had to leave behind to fend for themselves? And why didn't anyone count those things? People should tell the truth about what war costs, Vola had said. Weren't those, thing, weren't those things the cost of war, too? With a, with a start, Peter found that the dark was falling around him, a little panicked. He should have been looking for a place to settle for the night. He spun, he spun around. His left crutch shot out 
onto a patch of loose stones. He fell onto it hard and heard a crisp snap. For an instant, he feared, he feared rib, but the sound had been wood. He landed, still gripping the top of the crutch. Six feet away was his bottom shank. Stableman, it came out naturally, a satisfying word. He tried out some other swear words, and they felt pretty good, too. But the way the darkening woods absorbed his shouts without a response made him uneasy, so he stopped. He didn't have the luxury of venting anyway. He had a crutch to repair, and not much light left. All around him, trees shot out hardwood limbs that he could tape to the broken pieces as a splint but he had no hatchet to cut them. As he drew the bat out of his pack so he could find the tape, he realized that the solution was in his hand. He lined the crutch pieces, laid the bat over them, then began w winding the tape. When he was finished, he tested the crutch with his full weight. It held, strong and solid. He wished he could tell Vola she'd been right. He had needed her bat on this, jan on this journey. He knelt by his pack again. The accident had been warning enough. He pulled out the things he needed to make camp for the night, then scraped a bowl in the dirt and filled it with a pile of twigs and dried grass. He touched a match to it, and a little fire and a little fire crackled to life. Peter held his jack knife over the flames until he figured out it was sterilized, then gritted his teeth and, and slid open the new blisters that had formed on his palms. The pain made him gasp, but he eased on some of Vola's salve and took deep breaths until it numbed. The herb smell swept him back to her kitchen with a rush, and he wondered if she was there now. How was she managing without the without that heavy leg to anchor her? Before he put his knife away, he held it up. The last of the firelight danced along its blade. He remembered... The first time he'd seen Vola's knife, how shocked he'd been when he when she had gouged a chip of wood off her leg. Peter tugged up his jeans. He pressed the flat of the knife against his calf and tried to imagine slicing off a nugget of flesh because it offended him. Because it wasn't perfect. The coyote howl, howled. Then a second answered from a distance. Peter shivered. He turned the blade until the cool edge creased his flesh then jerked it up. The slice was only half an inch, but its sting was fierce. There were advantages, he could see, to be made of wood. The cut the cut bed it up, beat it up. As the dark blood began to drip, he drew it into the shape of a leaping fox. With his fingernail, he pricked out a pointed nose, then two ears, a wild smear of his thumb for the brush. Pax. Tomorrow, a red fox blood vow. So that was chapter 28 of Pax. Um, we're going to be doing chapter 29 this Thursday, which is going to be pretty cool. We're coming up to the end. There's still a few more chapters than I than I realized. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Pax. If you guys don't want to see more, remember to leave a like, subscribe, and all that kind of fancy match stuff. Tomorrow, I'm going to like freaking uh, hit y'all. With uh, some Nintendo Switch videos, which is going to be pretty fun. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to see. Um, I hope you guys are really excited to see more, more, uh, more Mario Kart and some other things. But until then, my name is Sean Alexander's on it. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye bye.